So we are restarting our podcast series, which we started during Ramzan due to popular demand. So um, we're going to pick new topics. Inshallah, this will go out on uh, Sunday at 7 o'clock. We'll have a mixture um, of rec- pre-recorded podcasts just because of the timing of our guests and, and topics. And some we will have live where we feel that it's going to be more interactive and we can get you. So we'll announce that beforehand and let you know um what the what what the session is going to be whether it's uh, a podcast but inshallah seven o'clock sunday we will have something some content for you to consume um on the paradise academy um youtube channel so today we have our guest but before i introduce the guest i'm going to introduce our esteemed scholar Molna sajid who is the imam at masjid the umar uh been the imam there for a long time and done a lot of community work and we're going to talk about that today because today's podcast is very much about the community and what some issues that we're facing and we have our esteemed guest naz naz do you just want to introduce yourself some of your background um and the topic today please assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh my name is naz um i'm the founder of a, a beautiful company called consequence um we have been in and around uh, for about just short of 11 years but this is our 10th year properly within working with young people and what we do is 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 we go out into schools and we deliver presentations we go out into mosques we go out into to uh, colleges uh, youth clubs and the aim is is to deliver presentations around the consequences of crime. So some of the issues that are facing our communities today, um, gone are the days where you can just brush it under the carpet and think no. So what we've done is in the past, um, as uh, Masjid Umar will know, uh, with especially with Masjid Umar and other mosques around the area, but um, we've done presentations uh, where ex-offenders uh, come in and talk to young people about what will happen to them. No ifs, no buts, no lies, uh, none of this, or my uncle told me this and my cousin told me this. We, at Consequence, the aim of it and why it came about um, is because I myself is have been down that path of crime. Um, I, I made mistakes in my life and I ended up in crime, um, getting involved with drugs. And what happened then was, was basically I got myself a nine-year sentence and, yes, set my own company up, which is called Consequence. And it means inducing change through education, just to educate the young people of today of what will happen if you go down this path. Um, Having been through the process, I realised this is something that I want to do. Um, but luckily for me, alhamdulillah, with the will of, will of with the will, with the will of God, um, I was chosen to go uh, work uh, voluntarily with the Prince's Trust, uh, His Royal Highness Prince Charles's organisation. Um, and then within a matter of uh, six weeks to eight weeks, um, I was told, you know, they want me to work for them and go out and deliver presentations for them to young people around crime. Um, and alhamdulillah, from then onwards, I did that for two years, and then I came out. Oh, mashallah, amazing. Um, Mola do you want to just explain what the our Girlington brand is of this uh, Girlington Muslim Welfare Association? As um, there's a couple of brands that were are underneath this general banner, and the the work we do in the community is under the our Girlington brand. Do you just want to some of the work we've done, some of the work we've done with NAS and, and consequences, and some of that outreach work, Mola Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahirrahmanirrahim. First of all, assalamu alaikum and jazakallah for inviting me onto the show. Um, and it's nice to see Naz again. Um, yeah, alhamdulillah. Uh, I always see you, so you're, you're, you're <laughs> so nice. <laughs> We've been seeing to, uh, each other too much in Ramadan as well, on the podcast. So, mashallah. <laughs> assalamu alaikum to you, Baba, as well. Wa alaikum assalam. No, mashallah. So basically, we're known as Masjid Umar, and Masjid Umar, its official name is GMWA, Girl into Muslim Welfare Association. And from this association, it has three branches. The first one is Masjid Umar, the Masjid itself. The second one is the Paradise Academy, which our YouTube channel is named after. And that's our madrasa, our supplementary school that happens the evening. And the third thing is our Girl into and this is a branch that I really stress to our committee and uh, our mosque about that we need to really uh, do and promote. It's bringing 
ilm into action, knowledge, whatever we learn into action. Our deen is a whole way of life. And sometimes we just restrict it to ibadat and worship in the masjid. But no, alhamdulillah, it's a beautiful whole way of life. The way that we eat, the way that we get married, the way that we have children, ta'aleem, tarbiyat, and so many life skills uh, it includes as well. So it's about whatever we learn, we put into practice. And this was a great opportunity. And I think our government and the whole purpose of this, we want people to take pride in their community, in their society that they live in. And as Muslims, alhamdulillah, throughout our history, wherever Muslims have gone, they've con contributed to society. And they made a big difference to society and positive differences to society. And alhamdulillah, here we have a lot of positive role models, a lot of positive people that every day play a major part we see in the schools. We have Muslim teachers, we have Muslim doctors, we have Muslim lawyers, businesses, you know, workers, just everyday workers. We contribute a lot to society. And sometimes we need to champion these people and the work that they're doing. And also as aspire our next generation of youth that, you know, instead of going into a life of crime or no hope, there's so much that we can do. And how do we get there? Alhamdulillah, you know, that's the hope of the podcast is to bring on people that they can aspire to be like and learn from them and also hopefully choose the right choices and the right path so that they can ultimately, first and foremost, please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and second of all, please the people that they are serving around them. And that's the whole purpose of our Girlington. Our Girlington is for our people to take pride in their community, to participate in their community, and to make a difference to their community. Alhamdulillah, we are Muslim, we worked with Naz a couple of times. Uh, mashallah, he, a few years ago, at the Girlington Community Centre, he, at the upstairs, he arranged as a, as a prison uh, and a courtroom. And he did a live role play of what it's like when you commit a crime, the consequences that you face when you go to prison, how prison life is like. And, you know, when our students from the boys and the girls that attended, they were shocked. And like I mentioned it previously, you know, in Gurnington, unfortunately, we've got 11, 12, 13 year old kids that are approached by middlemen, you know, to pass on drugs. So, you know, we got to teach our kids that that's not the way to go down. It might be easy money, it might be flashy cars and everything, but it's a life of haram and wrong. And better than that is, yeah, choose a nice career path, choose a good job, choose, you know, contribute to society, make a difference. But, you know, do it the halal way, do it the way that will please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, you know, help and contribute to society. So similarly, we also called uh, Naz in Ramadan, I remember a few years ago, and he did a PowerPoint presentation. And a lot of our elders were present there and they were shocked when Naz were going to, uh, through the different categories of prisons and what prison life is like. And, you know, so it was a hard hitting message, but, you know, it taught us a lot of lessons. And that's why today we brought Naz onto the show as well, so that the whole purpose of Naz can talk about his experience. There's no point in Nansaji talking about life in prison because he's not been to prison. Do you understand? You know, when you hear it from, you know, uh, people that have gone there, and, you know, it makes a difference, it, it hits your heart. And that's why, you know, Alhamdulillah, Naz accepted our invitation. And hopefully we, and rather than listen to me, you always listen to me, uh, listen to uh, people. Uh, hopefully, you know, this becomes a means for, you know, us to make the right choices in our life. And we can Inshallah. learn a lot from Naz. And hopefully we'll work together in the future as well. Inshallah. 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 Mashallah. So Naz, on, on some of the topics that you've mentioned and some of the topics that Molna mentioned there, I want to I wanna just go back and almost the start of the journey. So you talked about crime and some bumps in your life. And I'd, I'd like to talk about mindset if, okay. if that's possible. So when, and, and to, to just to pose a question. So um, a lot of the time when people are doing wrong, um, there's never an element of I'm gonna get caught because if there is that element, you wouldn't do it, right? So what's, what's the mindset of when you're doing wrong and the aspect of do you ever think you're gonna get caught? What's kind of your thought process there? So Alhamdulillah, let me let me take you back to, to so the viewers can actually those that don't know me can see where I'm coming from. So um sometimes they always bring it back to certain elements of of how one blames others. Um and I believe I did 
um, and this is where it is. So I was born, uh, and my father passed away when I was at the age of, of uh, four. Um, and I had no brothers, no sisters, uh, no cousins. Um, probably the probably uniquest family in, in England with with just one other family member, that's it. Uh, there's no family cousins all over, spread it out in Bradford or anywhere like that. So as I was growing up, you've got to understand, you know, um, I always had this mindset that, that I have to do good. I have to do good at the end of the day. And I know where growing up and I've seen my, my, my mother, uh, bless her, um, sewing people's clothes and stuff. And I just didn't like that type of stuff. And I thought, what, what, what? what? You know, she's doing everything. She's playing the mother's part. She's playing the father's part. She's also playing a brother, a sister, all in one. And I realized, I watched that whatever I wanted in life, I got. So from your olden day computers um, to clothing to whatever I needed, I had to wait a little bit, but my mum would always get me it. So don't ever think that, oh, you know, as a, as, as, as a situation of, you know, hang on, you know, you had no father and no male role model. You know, this is one of the elements that the government or the, the, the statistics show that you can go down this path. No. You know, my mum gave me everything and, and, and she taught me from right from wrong and she taught me about halal and haram and everything. So you've got to understand where that mindset was. So until I got to the age of, of getting into schools and colleges and stuff and whatnot, that's when it started to change. So I'd go out there and I'd look at these people and I'd think, you know, look at him. He's got a beautiful car. He's got a lot of money. He's got a wallet. He's got chain. He's, he's got the bling. I want that. And I remember talking to these people and they, well, they, they used to give you the guidance of um, school's not going to get you there. Uh, school will teach you how to speak English, but it won't help you because you're not going to become an engineer. You're not going to become a doctor or a barrister. They're not going to accept your type of colour of your skin, as in i.e. Pakistani Muslim. So when I started listening to that, I started seeing certain things of people who had degrees before us who were going into degrees, got, got the degrees, really good degrees, went to university, got degrees and going towards jobs. And then afterwards, seeing them working for average jobs, normal jobs, which an average person can get and, and talking to them and, and realising that even they were saying there was no point us going to education because every time we get to a point where we've got our grades, we've applied for jobs once again, the colour of our skin, the religion, the ethnicity, we're not getting these jobs. So I'm sorry, but as a young person, when I saw what was in front of me, I didn't care what the education system told me. And at that time, Islam was just a whole thing of, of come back from school, uh, quickly get changed and run to the mosque at the end of the day. And in my days, when you go to the mosque, it was being taught and it wasn't there was no passion from from my side to learn. And second, if you did anything wrong, you'd get beat. With the with the stick and stuff in them days, and I remember those days. Alhamdulillah, the 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 the, the mechanisms and the musters and the medusas that are in place today. Wow, I would so love to go and 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 take those people away that taught me and put these people into the place and say, please, you know, with the way you're teaching me, you know, I, I've seen where kids are shouting and arguing with the imam and the imam, imam's calm and say, look, no problem, this is what it is, this out, and I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, why do we get this? So, you know, there's a lot of things you can put into blame and say this, that, but no. It all boils uh, down forget to my home yourself life, as an individual. Life. So mother, father, father working, taxiing, restaurant, mill, whatever, you name it, he's, he's grafting. The mother is, is looking after the house. That's a job in itself, looking after the kids, the house and everything. Um, uh, then you get to see these kids thinking, hang on, you know, um, I'm not managing to get as much of, of, of stuff that I need in life. So I'll go join a group or, or a gang, as they call it, or my local boys. And before you know it, um, you start realising that standing out there, smoking cigs and doing cannabis and stuff, it costs money. And if you haven't got that money, then you just stood there and you looked upon as nobody. So what then happens is, is, is you start looking and thinking, where's my opportunity? And unfortunately, just like every other city in the UK and probably other countries in the world, Bradford is one of those where our hopeful young people are not looking up to the imams or the doctors or the barristers or the ones that have got genuine jobs and stuff and whatnot. No, they're not. They're looking at these drug dealers who are driving around in these flash cars, driving and, and living in these big houses um, and, and wanting this fast life now. Type. And I think so now basically the, 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 the youngsters, they, they want these temptations and desires. No yeah. matter, like you said, parents will teach them what's right or wrong. The yep. mosque will teach yep. them and their teachers at school. Yes. But it's Everyone. that desires and temptations that, you know, I want that and I want it now. Yeah. Like, is, is that what I, it is? I, 
I, I, I work in other areas and other areas have got other issues. So Chapeltown, Leeds, Manchester, Liverpool, all these areas will come under the same uh, um, um, process of I want this because I want it now. And then I've worked in some really posh areas like Harrogate, for example. And when you're working with the kids there, their ambition isn't a drug dealer's lifestyle or anything like that or a gang member or anything. What their ambition is, is, is I want to get to this stage, to this point, and then I will go on to this place. And for me, when I look at that and I think, what's the difference? What's what's happening over there that's hap not happening over here? And for me, it all starts with schools, education, the services, the providing of it at the end of the day. Um, the you talk about these people in Harrogate and you talk about the people in Bradford and their ambitions being that they want to go on to be... Uh, educated and they want these no good problem. jobs, I've whereas, in, whereas in Bradford doesn't. So as I was saying, the young people uh, that I meet in Bradford and, 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 and I talk to them about, look, get to your education, get your education down here, it's key, afterwards you'll be able to open many doors. And the reply that I get back is, why am I going to do that when my brother and my sister have applied at, at Dunn University, got really good degrees, um, whatever they are, uh, in whatever career paths, when they've applied, not got the job. Why? Because because of the colour of the skin, because of the, the religion they are. I was like, no, you, you, it's, it's a lie. Trust me, don't worry. And then a few of them even actually introduced me to their family members and, and even they are saying, look, we lost hope. We've gone there. We've done everything, what the government and, and our parents and everyone pushed us to do. And we thought this was the right way. We've done it. We've got the de degrees. We've done better than some of our other classmates who don't happen to be a Muslim of, of, of background um, um, or Pakistani origin. But they've managed to go out and get better jobs, but we haven't. So we're now working in, for example, Morrison's Farmers Boys, and we're doing taxis and stuff. And it's like, this life that, 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 that they've gone through, even they've seen it, that even they've got their grades and stuff, and it hasn't benefited them in any way. So some of the young people that have come through that family now are looking and thinking, well, I'm not doing that because that was that's not worth it. I'm definitely not going down that path because that'll be a waste of time and cost, and I'll be in debt. And, and you're talking about when people go to apply for jobs and... They, they get this they make this thing of oh i didn't get it because of the color of my skin and the race and stuff like that so and, and that reminds me of a couple of stories and obviously i've been down that path i've been to i've been to interviews and i can honestly say that i've never gone into an interview or come out and thought that oh i didn't get that job because of the color of my skin or anything like that alhamdulillah but what can we do to um and this is i'm gonna i'm gonna put it to nas first i'm gonna put it to Mona as well because there's a couple of studies that come up in our religion gives a good example of this, but how can we overcome that to let somebody know that actually that might not have been because because of your colour of your skin, it might have been because your interview technique, it might have been because of your CV, because of your experience, it might have been because of genuine thing, did you go ask for feedback? How can we get to people to say actually, it probably wasn't your colour of your skin, you're just not going for the job. Do you, know, do you know, with that, the, 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 the beauty of it is this, there's a couple of ways. So, so yes, you're right there, because what happens is when a person goes to an interview, he messes up, um, he thinks, right, what should I do? He comes out, comes home, and all the family's waiting. You can picture it. What happened? Oh, he was racist. I'll use the red card. Oh, he was racist. Simple, he was racist. So now when the younger generation are sat there going, oh, my God, racist. He went to degree, he got a degree, he went to uni, he was supposed to have a really good job. That's first thing. So be open and honest. Say, look, you know, it could be... I was not good enough candidate for it or X, Y, Z. But then you've got the others who have applied for the job and they've got a no, but they've applied for the same uh, uh, credentials with a different name, as a, as a, a, not a, a, a Muslim name, and they've been given an interview letter. So for those, I can't really kind of think. But when it comes to young people, all I say to them is, is his path is written by Allah. And if it wasn't meant to be down that path, then he cannot justify saying that guy behind the desk, he was this, he was that. He has to look at it as Allah himself put me down this path and he's closed this door for now, but he'll open up another door somewhere else. And I know we talked about earlier on where sometimes we just need that guidance and it's somebody just to tell us this is the choices that you should make in school or this is what you need. When we were talking about how can we always, you know, it's like when somebody fails the driving test and it's always, oh, the driving instructor was racist. No, it's not that. We weren't prepared or we didn't have the skill set. So the thing is, sometimes it's these things that we're missing in our life, and it's that guidance from some person, some individual, uh, some choices, life choices that we need to make. So I think that's why it's very important that whilst these youngsters are growing up, they face a lot of challenges.
as I've gone through my time, I've said to people, you know, one one of them was like, well, what did your brother do your, your, your degree in? Medicine, right, good, well done. Yeah, there's over 100,000 people doing that. Why didn't he get into dentistry? Why didn't he get into something that he thought, hang on, everyone went towards IT. Sorry, when the whole world's going towards IT, there's not that many jobs for IT anymore. So it's always trying to say to them, look smart, look where the gaps are, look where everything is. Like some of the young people that I've worked with, mechanic, 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 mechanic. And a couple of years ago, we had this thing. I said, listen, you do know everything is going to go electrical one day. Yeah. So some of the young people decided, you know what? We want to do mechanics, but we don't want to do electric. We don't, we don't want to do the normal mechanics. We're going to do the electrical side of stuff. And mashallah, today, four years on, they're in a better position because they've had the guidance and, and, and influence by people to say, go down this path. Mechanics, the same thing, but the electric side of it is going to be up and coming. Most of my young people, their minds have gone the minute they're in school and the school systems, some of them, you know, the, 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 the mindsets are, are completely like, oh, well, I'm interested in getting myself a girlfriend first. Now I'm interested in, in, in getting patterns in my hair or furthermore, I might put contacts in because I want to look a bit different. And then it goes down that part of I want the designer gear. Why am I wearing uh, uh, um, next clothes when I want Gucci, Montclair, Fendi, you know, can you can you even spell Fendi? But they want the clothes. And this is for me where I stand with young people and I say, and this is what something that I went through, you know, your bling, your car, your watch, your properties, your businesses, you know, everything, all from the, the, the name of Haram, of, of selling drugs. What I class it as is, is I'm destroying lives. And, and you know, what I do is, is over time, I, I I sat with with many many scholars, and I remember sitting with 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 the Imam here as well, and Mashallah. And I'm saying, you know, I, I feel if I did this, and I gave some of my own personal life experience to some of these young people about where I was, what I did, where it happened, what happened to some of the scars all over my body from some of the fights in prison. Maybe if I can just get to one young person to say, listen, I've been there. I've done it. Please believe me, this is exactly how it's going to happen for me. It's going to happen for you and everyone else. The ones that you're listening to, they're just saying it to you because they don't want to tell you, you know, how it all starts in this day and age. It's here, do these drugs for me and I'll give you 150 quid. To a young 15-year-old kid, 150 quid, that's a pair of Nike trainers. The next week, it's mm -hmm. another 150. He'll save that and buy himself a nice pair of jumpers. Two, three weeks later, when he saved the money, he'll go buy himself a Gucci bag. Now he's balling. He thinks he's somebody. So there are certain things like that. Other other things that I will always say is is having centres. And I, I really cannot wait. And I hope and pray Allah Ta'ala makes it happen sooner or quicker that the day uh, Masjid Ummah can actually open its its doors, you know, on the new beautiful building that's been built. Mashallah, absolutely beautiful. You know, the time, the effort. And in there, I've been in there personally where, by, by the Imam of the toy in there. And I cannot wait because the rooms in there, you can have one room designated specifically for young people to come to and say, right, I want to go down this path. I want this information and this, 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 this. Why are we just leaving it to the school for that one day? Oh, I've got uh, someone coming into the school and he's going to guide me. He's got 340 people just in one year to guide. Do you think he's taking it serious? Where does, where does the mosques, I believe, alhamdulillah, could have that guidance in early stages and say, right, so where do you want to go? Okay, so do you want to do a five-year plan with us and we will help you on that path? Or do you want to do X, Y, and Z? Are you, with, are you someone that can work with their hands? Is it mine? So having that kind of early stage intervention, I personally feel works every time. And a young person feels more confident knowing that, hang on. So, for example, Mr. Duma, if we were to call in all of our uh, uh, educated, uh, sophisticated businessmen and people in, in high-ranking positions... Uh, um, um, and, and we can guide you to where we went, how we found it, and how we're going to take it further. And I think a lot of young people then will aspire to something like that, I think. Is there any, any guidance around persistence where, and I, Nas touched on it really well there, where he says that um, you, you've gone to a job interview, you've gone there, you thought you, you thought you got it, or you thought you, you thought you did okay, but you come back and it says, no, we reject you because of whatever reasons they give. For polite reasons, or the politically correct reasons they give you. So, what is there around, you know, uh, again, that's to turn it around, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala closing past and being the best of planners? Is there any stories that we can pick from Islam or any any guidance we can get from our beautiful religion around that, Mullah 
so, so one of my uh, one of my personal experiences is I was in a cell. I had nothing. I had nothing whatsoever. And all I remember was 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 uh, me just sat there and I thought, do you know what? Today is the time that I'm going to actually ask uh, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala that whatever I want in my life, you know, I'm going to ask Him because I'm in the lowest of the lowest. How far can I go? And I remember asking Him. And I, and I, you know, when you truly ask for the change in yourself, and you know, I did, I asked, and I remember some of the words, I'm not going to go through all of them, but one of them was, Yalla, you get me out of this prison, you get me home quicker to my mum, yeah, and leave, let, let my mum be the way I left her, um, and I promise you, Yalla, I'm going to change my ways, and not only my ways, I will go out there and I will, I will guide as many young people away from this, this calamity, this, this, this disastrous, this sinful life, and Wallahi, it's like as if the next day, everything just was going my way. And it was like, what? How? And this is where I realized that once you've made that one-to-one -one connection with him and you've made the path of your life thinking, you know what? I want to change. Then this is where Islam comes in and teaches you because there are stories. And there's so many stories out there that, that you look and you think and you're thinking, wow, you know. Why wasn't I taught this? And it's because at the end of the day, when we're young, we don't want to listen. We think we know better. So that's why one of my part is that I believe there are many stories from Islam that one can take up, inshallah, and, and guide himself on. Now, 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 can I ask you a question? How did... Uh, uh, it must have been difficult for your mom, like, because she was the only one. And uh, when you got sentenced, and how was that feeling? How was it? And can you just explain? Yeah, yeah, not a problem. So basically, when when I got sentenced, remember, it's me, and my mum, no brothers, no sisters. So um, I get sentenced, and I remember my mum used to say to me every day, you know, put to eat something, eat roti. I'm like, no, I don't want roti. I'm all right. I'm going Nando's. I'm going burger. I'm all right. Don't worry about it. It's all right. She was like, look, you know, there's gonna come a day one day when you're gonna be crying for this. And I went, no, no, it's not, mum. I'll, I'll, I'll always have it. I'll always be here. Don't worry. And anyway, cut long story short, I went, I got sentenced, and I broke the news to my mum, and my mum was like, well. What will you be done for it? And I told her that I did drugs. And I remember her face just like, what? And then she started blaming herself, which is which is one of the the parts of me that kills me even to this day. You know, she thinks it's because of me not having a brother, a sister, a father, I turned this way. So it took a long time for me to explain to her that it wasn't her. She did everything for me. It was just me, mum. I, I got onto this stupid vibe of I know better and I'm gonna go down my path. And in that path, remember, I forgot about my mum. With, with, with my mum, so I get sentenced, I remember making that first phone call and I remember making the first phone call from inside and, and I'm, I'm ringing and I'm saying, mum, I'm so sorry. And she said, you know, she dropped it on me and she just dropped such a bombshell on me, which was unbelievable. She said, um, what have I not done to, to provide for you, you know, and why have you chosen this path? And now that everyone's on the street are going to be thinking that you used to bring that money home and give it to me, whereas I never used to see any of your money and nothing. And you were very clever at hiding your stuff. And I was like, mum, I'm really sorry. I did this for a reason and this is what it was and, and I messed up and she was like well you know you've been sentenced you know but what's going to happen you know you, for the rest of your life is this what you're going to do and I was like mum don't worry when she found out I got nine years then that's when it started no one ever told me about this so people have brothers families friends neighbours helpful people my friends family there was nobody you know my friends fake friends they were there for the money and the crime and yeah drugs let's go let's party but when stuff like this no they didn't even knock on the door so you've got to understand now i'm in armley prison armley's just around the corner and it takes an average family member 25 minutes to half an hour to get there in car for my mum she used to have to get out of here get a taxi from girlington taxi straight into interchange from interchange a train into leeds from leeds a bus from there straight out to armley prison and then wait for me then see me for half an hour, 45 minutes, and then go back. So it'd take her four to five hours just to come visit me on her own. And every time she'd come, right, I was so scared that what if someone just kidnapped certain or took stuff off of her or bullied her, hit her or anything. I, I'm not around to see. I'm not allowed to support. And I remember saying to my mum, mum, I'll send somebody to, to, to look after. And she says, you know, don't do that. I've got God. She says, God gave me you, but you didn't, you didn't, you didn't want to be here. So don't worry, I've got God. You just take care of yourself and don't worry about me. If I was to die, just remember in it that you're going to come out of prison on, in chains, handcuffed to do, to do my bread deal. And I think them early days when she said that, that was it. You know, I, I, a couple of weeks later, I started seeing 
people's family members dying outside and how I'm saying I started seeing, it's not that I could see outside, is, is we're all sitting on the wing, chilling and whatever, uh, painting, eating food in your cell. Next minute, no, the door hits, opens, and the guy starts crying. What happened? What happened? Oh, his, his, his brother's passed away. His sister's passed away. His mother's passed away. His father's passed away. And that's the point where you think, oh, my God, was it worth it? What What is this? And once again, I went on my knees and I prayed to Allah and I said, Ya Allah, you protect her, please, for me, please. And mashallah, you know, Allah listens in, in, in times of, of, of weird places and times you may be in, but he listens and then it's time for him. But for me, going through other prisons, other other things, started seeing how long it used to take my mum to get there and back, you know, not realising I used to ring my mum three times a day, early in the morning, yeah, uh, afternoon and evening. And, and anyone that's been in prison will, will verify this. This is how quick the conversation used to be. Salam alaikum, walaikum salam. You okay? I'm okay. I'll speak to you at 12 o'clock. Khuda put the phone on. Because it's, that's how quick the money runs out inside prison. So that's when I started to realize that, whoa, why did I get into all those drugs when I've got a, a mother that I have to look after? And then you had other drug dealers, known notorious drug dealers from Liverpool, Manchester, Leeds, you know, not Muslims, but just other drug dealers would come up and say, you're a bit stupid, you are. You know, I'd be like, why? Well, you've got no brothers, no sisters, you're not married, you've got no kids and you've got no father, but you still went and did drugs and left your mum on your own. Nah, you're not a man. And I think well, that's the point when I started to realise that this is what I needed to hear from, from male models rather than do drugs, gangs, this, that, money, power. No. So for me, I think I went on a different kind of a, a, a situation with it. But the hardest time that was killed wasn't by me. Uh, it was by my mum all by herself in this wall. I was in a prison cell with 360 people on one wing. I had seven wings or five wings. My mum just had herself and this four wall that she's living in. And and this just now, through quarantine, she's had to isolate herself off again. And I've been with her and she keeps telling me this is exactly how it was for four and a half years. Oh. So every day, day in, day out, no one comes, no one goes. There's no phone calls coming. Only people ringing from India to say, do you want this insurance? To the insurance? But wallahi, nothing. I was like, mama. I, I really understand what you went through was 10 times worse than I went through. And I'll never... So, so and, and, and that's, you're, you're, you're basically telling us the guy that does this, he just thinks about himself, isn't it? His own greed, his own ego, his own name, his own status. He doesn't think about his family. He doesn't think about his brothers and sisters. Yeah. And, but unfortunately, when uh, he gets in trouble, then unfortunately he's... He's, he's calling out for them. And uh, that time is too late. You know, you didn't want to know your parents. You didn't know, want to know your mom and dad. You didn't know, want to know your brothers and sisters. And today when you're all alone, that's where you're remembering them. You're remembering Allah. You're remembering them. So it's very, very important that, you know, unfortunately this life that what people think uh, is cool, it's a very greedy and just centered around that person and himself and his status and his ego. So the thing is, um, we've got to learn that we've got to appreciate what the gifts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. And there's always going to be two ways, the right way and the wrong way. And it's down to us which route we choose. And it's very easy to do haram. Haram is easy to do. Temptations and desires are always in front of us. But it's hard and difficult to do the halal because that's the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's Rasul and unfortunately shaitan doesn't want to go towards the good and the, um, and remember we mentioned a hadith several weeks ago that you know between all, uh, behind all good actions is jannah and behind all these fame and the money and everything is jahannam is the hellfire but unfortunately mm -hmm. we've discarded the life hereafter and we're just thinking about us in this world and our temptations, our desires, and we're ready to sacrifice everything for our status, our name and fame. And like you mentioned previously, Naz, that it's not just in the Asian community. It's unfortunate drugs and crime. It's amongst the rich. It's amongst the poor. It's amongst the elite, the non-elite. And it's, 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 a, it's a lifestyle. I remember several years ago, I was working with the police, and uh, one day they called the LAPD, and they did a whole... Uh, like a roadshow on uh, how they tackle crime in, in LA and uh, they mentioned it's a lifestyle from the vests to the clothes that they wear to the fingers and how they meet one another to the cars that they drive so it's a whole lifestyle uh, that people adopt 
And once yes. you choose yes. that, you've got to go on to that lifestyle. And unfortunately, Make, that lifestyle is very yeah, yeah. contradicted to Islam. So it, it, we've got to make the right choices. Like you said, it's easy to go down this road. But like you said, the consequences, we don't think that that's what it's nice to hear from yourself. Now, you know, I, like you said, just you think about your mom in these last three, four months uh, in quarantine at home. Just imagine the four and a half years, you mm -hmm. know, how hard it must have been you know, for an old woman at home. No, nobody around her. I love that she had a love with her, but you know her her uh, son. You know we we forget about those things, and like you said, just that journey to Armly for your mom you know, and to get back. You know, like you said, you always wondered. Hopefully, she got back safely, and you won't know until the next week. Do you understand? And these are things we don't think yeah. about. It might or be little things. But even this, is, you know, this is one thing that you have to understand. You know, as as I've been working with communities all over, and 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 remember, like you've said there, and and and, and I love you've touched on that because. It's not just Muslim communities that are, are doing drugs. I'm in communities where Christian communities, yeah, Jewish communities, Sikh communities, Hindu communities, all over is this new thing of, of being shown on the media and stuff. And how I've seen it, and other people have said it to me, is and 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 surely the the some of the imams I've met have said, Naz, you know what? I, I agree with you. Um the young people that are doing these drugs and going into this lifestyle, yeah, what they don't realize is they've sold their soul to the devil. In my eyes, dealing drugs and going out there and, and causing misery and, and hurt and destroying lives for what? For a car, for image, for looks, for stuff that can be taken away like that with the Crime Commissioner's Poker Award, the Confiscation Award that comes on. People don't understand. I made all the money. I stashed it. I put it in places. There's other people way, way bigger than me. I was just a little fish compared to some of these big people. What's happened to them? Family stripped apart. Wives have gone into prison. Brothers and siblings have gone into prison. Mothers and fathers have gone into prison because of the fact that there's been money lying around and because the parents didn't want to lie and say whose it was. They've ended up going into prison. Now, for the person who sat there and I've met them and I've said, you know, wow, you've got a really long sentence, you know, com 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 compared to drug dealers. He says, yeah, because... It was either I take a lower sentence and my mum gets sentenced, my brother, my cousin and my uncle, or I take the blame, which was my idea anyway. And this is where I start talking to him saying, you know, if only we knew what it was like now after losing everything. I went to court, the judge took everything away from me. Property, car, business, bank accounts, clothing, jewellery. People that I was giving stuff to borrow, they were t even pulled in. So when the police want to come for you, they'll come for you. They'll give you a little bit of leeway to say, let's see how far this one can go. Because remember, at the end of the day, in every community up and down the country, three to four times a year, you know, around around holidays periods and, and ongoing uh, uh, protocol that they've got operations, but mainly around Christmas and stuff, they do the operations of like, where they'll call it Operation Custard, Operation something, where they come out and they target these known drug dealers. So don't think as a community that the police aren't doing anything and they don't know. They know. They're just waiting and biding their time to say, OK, let's see how far you can go and how many more people you can involve. Bringing it back to... to, to, so to now the I want to ask you... Now that are still doing this... Now I want to ask you one question. And I want to go... Uh, each other, I want to try taking this down some of the... Some of the experiences you had at the different stages inshallah so people can get a real inshallah i want to try painting i want you to try painting for us a really vivid picture of feeling and emotion of what what you felt at the different what, stages what i'll say to that is, is what i'll say to that is is, is you're gonna need more than one podcast for that no, sir, uh, is, uh, I, uh, I think, uh, I think we should put Wallahi, I think we should put myself in for a nine-week podcast. That's nine-year <laughs> sentence and a nine-week podcast. I'll give everything that we need in that nine week. We could take it from family. We could take it through court visit. We could take it through police station visit. My experience in cells. My experience in the police station. My experience going to court, uh, to prison, uh, getting sentenced, going inside to a prison. The racism, the abuse, the gangland activities, the brutality of inside prison. And then the impact on family, the impact of me coming out into my community and being looked upon as all, and there's that drug dealer, to changing my ways, and then, alhamdulillah, to meeting Prince Charles. So I can do all of this for you, but please don't ask me no. to... No, 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 no
I, I think that's why, like, the, this group consequence is what I think Nas, when he felt that guilt, he felt bad, and he made dua to Allah, Allah, you know, change me and I can benefit others. So I think that's a major achievement because unfortunately, I've met many people when they've come back out, they, they, they're waiting for them, they're like magnets. And they've gone back into that lifestyle instead of doing tawbah yes. and going totally away from it. They've gone back. They got sucked back into it, and and I think it's it's easy for us to say, but the guy that comes out and Anas will know better is that it's very easy to get sucked back into that life. But that person that rises above that and says, you know what, it is. I'm going to make a stand. I'm going to make a difference. I'm going to teach my community. Look, this is the reality of it. And like you said, you know, Naz needs hours for this, you know. Um, and I think that's why the, what he's doing this form, this group when, of when consequences. Yeah, so like I was just saying, you you form this group see, of see, consequences when, for 10 years, you'll be doing work. I think this is what message from this podcast we need to get through to the wider community. There are people like Naz available. Take him, hide him, borrow him, you know, whatever. If you know, if you need to fund him, fund him. Please, but take him to your community, whether it's a mosque setting, whether it's a community center, and listen to his stories. They're hard hitting, but he's been there, he's done it, and you know what? He made a change to his life. He didn't, you know, give in, and he made a change. And look, guys, you know, we need to rise above this, and I think that's the greatest message. I think that's that's the question that I don't know, Baba probably had on his lips as well. That when you came out, what was, you know, what did you want to do? So you got to understand, like you've said that, and you've, you've said that perfectly. And, and we've got some beautiful uh, uh, Molanas here who are working in prison um, and, and, and see this day in, day out. So they can verify it from the mosque avenue of it as well. But from my experience and, and, and people that are still coming out is this. Remember, you are here in Bradford. You're in Girlington, Manningham. The closest thing you've got is probably West Bowling, Leeds Road. And you think, yeah, Leeds, I've done a bit of business and I'm somebody. You get put into prison. Now you're put into prison with bigger criminals from different parts of life, London. Birmingham, Nottingham, Liverpool, Manchester, Sheffield, uh, Glasgow, and now your your contacts list has gone twice, three times, four times. So you come out, and all these street people are looking at you, thinking he's connected. I want to be with him. So it doesn't take too long for someone to come and go. Is five hundred pound? Go buy a jumper. Furthermore, in this day and age, they don't even give you money. They take you straight to Harvey Nichols, buy you top end clothes, spend a grand on you, buy you the latest phone, and say, "Yo, don't watch that. You're my people." The reason why they're doing that is, is because they know this person's got connections. So even if that person thinks, "Right, I've changed. I'm staying. I'm keeping away from myself. I'm going to get myself onto this target. Not a problem." What happens then is the young people get together and so yeah, so so my, I've got this person. I've got that person. Who did you meet inside? Oh, I met so and so, so and so. No, you haven't. Ring him. So then he ring him, and then they'll they'll ask, oh, have you got drugs? Can you do drugs? Can you give us it? Because the person knows the person, they'll say, yeah, come up. If he comes up, I'll give you it. Now this person sat there thinking, I didn't want to do drugs, but there's nothing for me to do. I'm going to use my contacts. He now starts using this experience of I've got links here, links there, links there, links there, and it's within a matter of seconds is in the game. That option's there for everyone. Then you've got that option of coming out and thinking. Do I go back to where I was and start again, build a name, argue, fight, drug dealers, wars, turf, gangland, gun? I've got to get all of this again to start up again, to start a name, go down that path of destroying lives. But then what about what about what I've destroyed before? I destroyed lives. I came out. I asked God to forgive me. I've said I'm going to change my ways. What type of person am I going to be when I stand there in front of God one day and say, yeah, you did give me the opportunity, but I came out and I did it again? No. You know, this is one thing that you're going to be 100% stick with. Yeah, other things you say you're not going to do, we're, we're human beings, we make mistakes, we ask for forgiveness, that's what we're taught. This, when you've done that one-to-one -one with God in your own personal life, and you think, yeah, I'm not going to go down this way, help me with this, this. And it all flourishes too. I mean, like, comes through like, wow, you believe, you'd be shocked to think, hang on, Naz, you became the first ever serving prisoner to work for Prince's Trust, for His Royal Highness Prince Charles in UK. Yes, I did. Where do you live? Bradford, Girlington. All right, okay. How did you get the opportunity? Oh, I was in prison. Oh, okay. How did that happen? Well, I asked God, didn't it? I said, God, open the doors, help me. And that's where I changed. When I came out, I brought everyone to my street because I live, mashallah, on the street where uh, Masjid Umar is. And, and I remember coming and everyone coming there with cars and stuff and the top end cars hired and making noises. And yeah, he's out, he's out. And I remember what, what, I, what, what a, a life in prison told me. He says, where are all those friends that you had? That you told me about. I said, they're here. 
He says, no, they're not. Give it a week, give it six weeks, give it one year, give it three years, give it four years and four and a half years, four years, six months. The day you walk out, tell me where the friends are. Nobody, nobody. But the minute I come home, everyone's on his ear. So they come, they parked up. And I remember what he said to me. He said, uh, Naz, you know, if you've made a, a deal with God, one on one in your heart. I went, yeah, I have in my heart. It's me and God, no one else. I've done it. He says, well, then. Then go out there and tell them this, that basically that old person that you knew, he's dead. The new person is working with young people to take them away from crime. And if any of you doing drugs, be ready for me. Because those young people, if they come to me and tell me that they've been bullied, intimidated or anything like that, or forced into it, then wallahi, with the will of God, yeah, we will come intervene in the most peaceful way. But make sure that the young person knows what crime he's doing and where he's going to go. And throughout the years, I've had a lot of drug dealers who've rang me and said, why have you told this to, to our young person? And, I, and my, my reply to that is, is, is because it's true. No, it's not. Right. Have you been to prison? Yeah. What prison did you go to X, Y and Z? Or did you have it on box? Were you locked down? Did you run the whole prison? And this is where they always go. But, but as I can find out, you know, because I've still got 162 lifers inside prison. I can find out what wing you was on, how many fights you had, who you had your fights with and what your what, how, how often you got bullied. At that point, that drug dealer and me have that one to one. And he says, don't tell him nothing. But listen, man. Um, uh, don't tell him anything about me and I'm going to stay away from him and, and, and just not a problem, take care and this is where you know the young people then look and think so why didn't you change now why, didn't, why, did, why can you change and they can't and the honest question is, is, is I fear the day of judgement I fear the day of, of resurrection where we're all going to stand there and uh, we're going to have our sins given to us and I've heard stories and I've I've heard about how the message has been passed out. The good deeds is going to be on one side, has passed from one side behind your back. The other side is going to be this. And if it is one side, you'll be more the most happiest person and you'll be going straight to heaven. If not, you're going straight to hell. And then last but not least, I want to teach as many young people, be they, be Christian, Muslim, uh, Sikh, whatever, non-religious, it doesn't make a difference. Because on the day of judgment, I can only say that, ya Allah, if, I've come out and changed, then have a look at the ones that I've taught. Anyone that I've ever taught, even a little bit has stuck in, in, in there. Because my presentations can go on from the shortest is one and a half hour to four hours maximum I've done. So you've got to understand, even if a small bit sticks in there, then wallahi, on the day of judgment, I can ask and say, God, you know, I, I did a deal with you, Yalla, and I said I will change my ways and I'll teach others. Please bring all those others that, that did take something away from me and didn't go down this path. And I personally believe that on that day, if that day, the, the Allah Ta'ala says, here, look behind you there. You know, all the people that I've delivered to, if that could help me and get me out of hell, then I'm on the right path. Be it with no, money that, or without that money. Reminds me of a story. And that reminds me of a story. There was a man who was very you... simple. And what happened was, uh, he was thinking, when I die, what's going to happen to me? So he wrote a will to his children that when I die, make sure you burn my body and scatter the ashes all around the world so God can't gather me together. So when he did die, what was, this is what his children did. So in the narration mentioned on the day of Qiyamat, when he will be stood in front of Allah, Allah will ask him, why do you do this? Do you think that I couldn't put you back together? And this man is ashamed of all the sins. So Allah will ask him, why did you do this? So he said, I was just scared of you. This fear. He just mentioned, I was just scared of you. This day that we're talking about, the day of judgment, that I'm going to stand in front of you. Because of that fear, I said to my children, yes. because I've done so many sins, just destroy my body, put the ashes throughout the world so Allah can't put me back together so I don't need to stand in front of you. Out of your fear, nothing else. And because of Allah forgave him. Because he did it out of the fear of Allah. Allah so the thing is, look, Allah. you had sincere tawbah and you know you 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 had that commitment and that dedication. You know what? I'm gonna make a difference, not to my life, but to others around. Okay, I tripped up. But you know, the main thing is when you trip, and Allah likes it when we remember him, then Allah, look, I've done wrong. But Allah, you're the one that's forgiving and guide me. And that's what you did, and Allah picked you up. You know, and Allah gave you, you know, these opportunities. And you know, when, when, 10 years of consequences. And this is the work that, you know, mashallah, yeah. your work that you do. I think you really need to 
uh, highlight it to others. You really need to get into the community and tell people about it. And and I just wanted to ask another question on this was, you know, obviously you, you must have talked to a lot of families. What impact when you talk to families have you had or what feedback have you got from people or even the youngsters when you've talked to them? So from the family aspect of it, so for example, when I've delivered presentations in schools and stuff, I always offer that, you know, the parents go home, tell your parents, what do you mean? Tell your parent that you met Naz, this is what Naz said at the end of the day, blah, 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 the truth, nothing but the truth. And tell them this, that if they want to have a one-to-one -one with Naz, no problem, I will stand in your garden and I'll talk to you in front of your children. I'm not scared, I'm there to tell them the truth. So some of them called and have said, you know, Naz, you know, is there any chance you can come over? And mashallah, before all this COVID-19 was beautiful, you know, some of my young people to this day, I even got contacts with them and used to go to the houses and they say, right, dad comes in and mum comes in and, you know, obviously they don't speak a word of English and they're like, you know, our son basically, yeah, he comes home and he smells. And I'm like, what of? He smells, but we don't know what of. I says, yeah, no problem. Leave it with me. So what I've done is, is I got certain smells together. Let's just say I have a consequence uh, case with certain smells. Uh, products mm. and drugs that the family can see. And I say to him, is it smell like this? <sighs> yeah. Does it look like this? Yeah, we saw what? Right. Do you see Rizzler paper lying around like this? Achha, is this, this is Rizzler paper. What, so this is what they make the Rizzler with. Have they got this? This is roach material. This, this, this. We always see this. I said, right, do me one favour. From now on, yeah, take away that. Take away all this stuff so you start knowing. This is where the kids are like, why have you done that for us? Why have you told them that? They just wanted to ask you about me and how i said listen they're asking me of of help and support in finding out the telltale signs are you coming home are your eyes red are you not eating certain times but when you're eating at weird times and you're eating a hardcore have you got the munchies so i'm giving the the parents the full element of it yeah regardless if they like it or they don't like it they need to understand are their kids going through these stages are they at this stage then you've got some parents who want to know because they say look you know what when we talk to them about education, they go, yeah, yeah, school with teachers. When we talk to them about life, oh, don't worry about it, we'll find out when we go ahead. He says, when it comes to the, the drugs and this, that, we say, you're going to go to prison. They said, that's it, innit? That's all you're telling us. That's it. We know, we know. And what? Now that you've told us ins and outs, we can start picking on little, little bits. You know, like one parent said to his kid, he said, uh, but if you go to jail, <laughs> no one's coming to visit you. Not me, not your brother, not your sister, not your mother. None of my family members are walking into that prison. His mum was his mum. Other parents do it. You, nobody. And if one of us die, guess what? You'll be coming out in chains. So you've got to understand, now the parents have I've got little ammunitions to throw back at the kids to say, go for it, do it. But you're not staying under my roof. If I find trainers on you, if I find jeans, clothes, clobber, money, anything that's on you that's not justifiable you can't turn around and say mum gave me it because i'll ask mum you can't say brother gave me it because i'll ask him it's not your sisters vice versa then the other side of it is when we deliver to the girls and that mashallah the sisters i always say to myself listen you lot are the biggest help you lot are the biggest point in, in in part of that family who can say right i know what this brother of mine is doing he may be hiding it from my mum and dad but i can see i can sense it so you've got an opportunity to do something as well. Stand in front of him and say, you're my brother and I love you. I don't care what you think of anything else or anything like that. We've had arguments, we fight. So you're my blood, you're my brother. I don't want you to go down prison route. I don't want you to destroy drugs. Do you want, and this is, I know it sounds so horrible to say, but it's something that I, I, I've seen with my own eyes, with people's families. People have been drugs, doing drugs for years. Nothing's gone wrong. Not being caught, big house, big car, this, that, doing really good, gone to Pakistan, made big, big buildings, come back and then one day ring me and say, you know what? I said, what? My sister's taking heroin. You what? My sister, wallahi, is taking heroin, brother. I'm going to batter that drug dealer. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Are you with me? Hang on, brother, but you're the same person that's doing drugs as well. You're the same person that's selling those drugs out there to other people's sisters and family members. So why is it now that your own sister is taking it that you're flipping like that? And then when you go over and see that sister and you see her face and her body, how it's all changed from drugs, you think, yeah, Allah, what's this? And then, then, then the only thing that comes to my head is, is Allah's punishing you on this earth because you're doing misery to other family members. It's brought into your family now. So this is where I always say to the sisters and all my sisters that come to my program, you know, they're full of life. We love them to bits. They're full of life. We want them to grow. We want them to go out there and do successful stuff, go into beautiful jobs so they can stand on their own two feet and say, you know what? We've done something really positive for our family. 
This is one thing I always say to him. I say, just say to your brother, would you like it if I took heroin? Would you like it if I took cannabis? Would you like it if I took cocaine? And the reply you're going to get back is either with a slap or shout or swear or whatever. At that point, you tell them, saying, well, then remember, you're destroying lives. I'm going to give you one chance to change. If you don't change, I will talk to my mum. I will take it to my imam and I will tell my family members everything. At that point, you've got to understand the brother looks and thinks, my sister knows she's going to do this, she's going to do that. She's a snitch. It doesn't make a difference. What she's done is, is she's put that doubt in his head already that this family is, is against you. Then you've got the other families. Oh, don't worry, son. Bring it. Bring it. Give me the money. I'll sort it out. What you don't understand is, is you're harboring that criminal. And when the day comes, he gets arrested. When the money's in your account, there's been family members who have done committee and they've saved for years for the daughter's wedding. And the son's gone out and done a bit of drugs. They've come to the house to do a raid. They searched the house. They found the money in the mum and dad's room. It's uncounted for. The committee doesn't have an invoice or a receipt. It's money that's saved. The government took it. Don't be shy. Don't be sitting there thinking it's okay. You know, it's not our son. It's not going to happen to us. I can tell you the telltale signs. You can come to the masjid and have a session with me. You know, you can have an ongoing one-to-one -one with the imam to say, yo, my kid, you know, is involved with such and such. We can have a kind of a knit program where we can work with them on an in-depth level at home, at madrasa, on the streets. All I know is, is from one choice as a young person in Girlington, in Bradford, I made. Today, you know, I've... I'm, I'm at that stage where I've gone through the wrong side. I've come out of the mill, as they say, and I've come out of those rotating doors and I've never, ever looked back. Yes, I have gone back in to help other ex-offenders and my lifers who are in there. I go in and I work with them on a one-to-one -one basis. But I've never, alhamdulillah, with the will of Allah, I've never gone down that path. And so be it. To the day I die, I will not ever get involved with anything like that because it's our 10th year this year. We're aiming to turn it into a charity, inshallah. I would love to have one of you as one of our board members as well, inshallah, one day I can sit down and take that further. But as from us, as from consequence, and me personally, having been in the game for 10 years, well, 12 years, but 10 years for, for consequence, uh, and the work that I've done with Mushrik Ummah, uh, for me, it's something that I will do for free, for, with passion, with love, and, and, and I'm ready whenever you lot are. No, I think, uh, Naz, mashallah, you've hit the hammer on the head, and like we always talk about these, we talk about on the member, you know, everybody expresses, uh, you know, the fears, the, you know, when especially it's about crime, drugs, and we always talk about it, we always think, what should we do? And, you know, how do we eradicate this? The reality is, I think, this is a, a life choice, that a lifestyle that people choose, and it's very hard because the films promote it, the movies promote it, people want to be that bad boy, that, that name, that ego, everything that goes with it. So it's hard to pull people away from that because it's such a strong, strong pull that is. But we've got to show to people that, look, if you choose the right path and the path that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught us, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take you wherever. And Allah will bless you in your life, both in this dunya and definitely in the next world. So the thing is, there are bigger choices we can make and better choices. And inshallah, in the next few weeks, we're going to talk about different topics and different, you know, and sometimes we have identity issues. Sometimes we have issues of Islamophobia, sometimes of racism. Like now we're, uh, you know, witnessing in America what's happening. So, you know, these challenges are there and they'll always will be there. You know, there'll be different challenges. That's what dunya is. It's a, it's a place of challenges. But we've got to override these challenges, challenges yeah. and rise above this. And, and that's the main thing. And inshallah, you know, we we'll, we'll definitely work with Naz in the future. Uh, hopefully we even, if you, you know, Alhamdulillah, you know, Allah Ta'ala works in mysterious ways that, you know, we've opened up our own YouTube channel so we can promote good work. So, you know, hopefully we can work with yourself, like you said, on the different topics regarding the consequences of crime. And uh, so main thing from, especially today, is that remember, you're going to face the consequences both in this dunya yeah, and what those consequences you face life in prison, you know, your your is it your respect or your family, you know, the parting, the being separated away from them for many years, missing out on the happy occasions, all these consequences. When you come out, you'll have a you know a bad name, you'll have you know, looking for jobs it's gonna be difficult for yourself. Then ultimately, like you said, on the day of Qiyamah, when you're stood in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what co <laughs> consequences will you face then? And, and that's that fear we should have, okay? How am I going to stand in front of Allah? One thing, TK, if I've hurt myself, I've hurt myself. But 
you know, drugs is such you destroy, you know, communities and you destroy them in such a way that, you know, you know, I've got relatives and family members, unfortunately, have been there, done it, even gone to prison. And, you know, unfortunately, no matter how much you explain to them now, because they've gone so far apart, drifted away, it's difficult to reel them in. Do you understand? So the thing is, is, we've got to think one day we've got to stand in front of Allah and what answer am I going to give? And what consequences will I face on the day of Qiyamah? Remember, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves those youth that spend their youthhood in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that perform good actions. So this is the opportunity. Don't waste our youthhood on doing bad actions, but spend our youthhood in doing good actions, in pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that will be the ultimate success both in this dunya and in the hereafter, inshallah. We're saying here where, you know, you go to prison, you, you do your time in prison, you come back, and then we're talking about um, the afterlife and standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then having to answer for the crime. But those people who are, who are thinking about this, could they have the mindset and and why would it be wrong to have this mindset of uh, I've done my I've done my time. So when I stand on the day of judgment, I'll be alright. So I've done my time. I've done my time on the dunya. They might have done their time in the dunya, but like we said, it's sometime yeah, if they've done sincere tawbah and they've repented to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they've asked for forgiveness and they haven't gone back to that lifestyle. Remember, it's that lifestyle when they come out and they've come out and as a reformed person that dedicated his life to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in serving others, you know, making a community a better place. Then inshallah, ultimately, that person is going to be successful in the hereafter because that shows that his toba that he made has been accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if a person just says, Allah, Allah please forgive me, and then straight away he's gone back, forget coming out, even with inside, I think there's a whole culture of drugs and whatever else, what we hear from people. And then once you come out, then you can just think to yourself that that toba that I did make to Allah ta'ala, it was just, you know, it was a joke really. It wasn't a sincere toba. And if you really mean it, you've got to show it as well. And remember, look, we're, we're humans, we might fall, even after coming out, somebody might have made sincere toba and he's come out and he's getting pulled away. It's very, very important he finds the environment of good. What's that? The masjids. He connect himself with the ulama and tell him, look, I had this phase in my life. I went through, please keep my number, ring me, call me for masjid, call me for namaz, remind me if there's a program so I can attend. Do you understand? Then it's, it's very important that the good people in the community keep that contact with him. So that they remind you, okay, brother, in the mass time, oh, come on, there's going to be a program. So do you understand? We've got to reel these people in. Otherwise, again, from experience of what we've seen is, the, like Naz just mentioned it, he had people waiting for him as soon as he came home. These people are waiting for him. And like you said, they, their contact with this has extended now. And so it's very, very important that we do build these connections. That's why hopefully I think in the next couple of weeks we're going to have an imam who works in the prison on one of our podcasts to tell us how life is like in prison. And I think one of their work is that, especially when somebody does come out from their locality, they keep that connection with them so that they don't... Remember, it's that... Uh, what do you call it? Uh, they re... Rehabilitation. Uh, rehabilitation. And uh, there's a lot of re-offenders as well. A lot of people that come out, unfortunately, they quickly go back in because, you know, it's, it's like a magnet and they've gone back to that crime and they've gone back in and slowly, slowly they get used to that life and they think, well, it's not that bad going in. And then they just make a habit of coming out, going in, coming out and going in. So it's very, very important we, again, uh, reel them in, uh, have uh, some kind of connection with them, call them to, you know, any programs. It's like everything in life, you know, like our Osaj, you saw the teachers, is that if you have this connection with the beard, so that the beard will stop you from doing wrong. If you have connection with the masjid, you know, you, you might want it to go towards somewhere wrong. We're thinking, you know what, it's namaz time. And that stopped you from going towards wrong. And also it could be, you could remind me of something and say, oh, Sajid, it's, it's time for this. There's the, a the program on. Do you know what will happen if by going to that program, sitting in the environment of good, listening from pious people? What will happen is going to hit your heart. 
And when it hits your heart, that that environment we all strive for. It's like now we all miss. We're, now we're missing the environment of the masjid. We we miss that Ramadan in the masjid. Alhamdulillah, we've done a lot of worship and ibadah at home. But that environment of the masjid was something else. You understand? So it's it's that connection we've got to build people, and it's that connection with Allah. It's called ta'alluq ma Allah. That connection with Allah. If a person connected with Allah, hopefully, you know, he will stay away from the evil. Yes, if he falls into sin, he'll do tawbah. He'll ask Allah for forgiveness. Allah will forgive him. But it's very, very important that we keep connections. Thank you to Naz for uh, uh, what, showing, us, showing us some of the work that he's done and some of the consequences of crime, some of the experience he's had, and some of the really deep messages that we got there. So some of the basic messages that he's sending out to us is that you're not the only person that is affected by crime. He was really impacted by his, his mother was really impacted having to do five hours journey just to go see him, talking to him like for a couple of minutes on the phone um, and having to be alone even after she had him for company for so many years, brought him to young age, not having him there um, as she expected. Well, Allah had better plans. Um, and then him coming out and then having that pull back to um, the prison, all his all friends who had deserted him through his time in prison where he was alone and then um, him having to come out and then set that straight to say, listen, I'm not in this life again, but still having the pull, having contact from from that life still there. Now, Alhamdulillah, Naz is um, using them to good effect to be able to still have the contacts in that life, but uh, going back, talking to them and seeing the errors of their ways and learning. And some sound advice he got as well. Um, Alhamdulillah, we didn't get into the some of the details of how it's spent. We just don't have the time. We have a limited amount of time on these podcasts. And um, Brother Naz was mentioning how we could do weeks and weeks worth of content just about his experiences. But inshallah, we'll come back. Um, if you do need to speak to Naz, you're in some of these trouble, please reach out. We're here. We're the, we are part of this community. Our Burlington is for, for the people, not just of Burlington, wider as well. Uh, for the for the community, if you need help with any of these problems that we talked about today, reach out to us. You can either get in touch with us in the comments, um, or you can go to mustardumra.net. There's a contact page where there's phone numbers, there's email addresses, there's our address. We're closed at the moment due to COVID, but we have our timetables on there where Molna Saab or one of us, so, someone will be there at the mustard. Just come, knock, say you want to chat, someone will chat with you. Um, so there's many different ways to get in touch with us. Find a way, find a route. There's a uh, a page on there where you can just leave a comment. Uh, so if you need someone to reach out to, leave a comment. If we if we think that, or if you want to speak to Naz specifically, we'll try getting a message to Naz and try getting in contact with him. Um, so the message being, don't feel like you're alone. If there's any trouble that you're thinking, get in touch with us. We will try helping. Anything for you, Mona Saab? No, Jazakallah, Baba, you mentioned a uh, lot of good points and hopefully may Allah that gives the to do Amal upon everything that we've heard today. And the thing is, like I said to you, we're, the whole purpose of the podcast is just to raise awareness um, that we have good people in our community uh, that we can reach out to. Um, and so... And that's the whole purpose of the podcast, that every week, inshallah, we'll try to bring the people from the community um, onto this program so that uh, we can learn from them, learn from their experiences. And hopefully we can all, we're all in this together. It's a long journey to the hereafter, and we've got to help one another. That's the whole purpose, inshallah. So every Sunday, 7 o'clock, inshallah, on our YouTube channel, uh, The Paradise Academy, uh, inshallah, we'll have one podcast every week. So inshallah, please stay tuned, watch it, inshallah. We've got really good names uh, coming up, inshallah. Uh, but I don't want to spoil you by mentioning them. Inshallah, just stay tuned, like, subscribe, and watch our YouTube channel, The Paradise Academy. Uh, follow us on uh, Masjid Umar, uh, website the facebook and our instagram uh, and that's it inshallah may allah ta'ala accept everybody's efforts and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us for our weakness and may allah ta'ala accept this podcast today inshallah